What signs should hunters begin looking for to find deer? Well, the most obvious is their tracks. Old tracks, quite old. Yeah, very old. Must have been muddy because they're sunk down into the sand quite a bit. And they've lost all definition. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, but it rained last oh, night. Oh, look, look yeah. right here. Right. Yeah, this is, right here. This has been made sometime between eight and nine o'clock last night and now. So this track and this, tra oh, that's a nice big track there. You notice it's it's well defined. The right rain over hasn't here. blurred. We have even some better ones. Yeah, some really good ones. Right there. So this is a fresh track because it rained last night. This and we but, know a deer but, was in the but area. It's several hours old because you can see where the earth has been pushed up. It's lost. Mm -hmm. There's no moisture in it. The sand is just completely dried away. But this track is fresher than this track. Oh yeah, this track was. You can see it's been blurred by the rain. So this was made before last night, mm -hmm. whereas this was has been made since last night. But again, same here. But again, this isn't anything to get excited about because it tells you that the deer are here and they're coming in probably at mm -hmm. night. But uh, as far as getting too excited, you'd see tracks like this all, all over. The place, yeah. if, if it was all well, tracks standing. are the easiest deer sign to find, but deer leave tracks everywhere they walk, day and night. So tracks alone don't give you a big clue as to their behavior. And neither do another common sign, the droppings. But there they are. And, and like you said, they're, they're reasonably fresh because you can see they're shiny mm -hmm. and that mucilaginous covering uh, deteriorates very, very quickly. So when you find fresh dro or droppings like that that are still wet and shiny, particularly on a warm, windy day like that, you know they were made just a few hours ago. It helps to know if tracks and droppings are fresh. Now that tells you that the deer have been active during daylight and these aren't just night areas. But Glenn Dutterer and I wanted to find more definitive deer sign, more particularly buck sign, because that's what we're after. And we'll find it even though we're on a corner bordered by two county roads. The road doesn't bother the deer? No. Uh -uh. Okay, we got the swamp right over there. That's, that's my first hint, is I'm looking for a place that deer can go that I know hunters typically aren't going to follow. And I know that's a wet, swampy area, and hunters just don't bother it. So that's component one, a but refuge. The, the deer are obviously using that swamp now. Oh, yeah, sure. It's a good, safe place to go. It's a place to to be away from disturbance for whatever reason. Okay, now up here on the high ground, we have some, some uh, looks like some balsam or some fir trees here. Uh, these berries aren't worth anything to deer. Well, they'll nibble on them. I mean, these, Nibble on the berries? Sure, these are crab apples of, of different species, and they'll nibble on that, and if not, they'll certainly nibble on the branches mm -hmm. of the apple. I mean, this is typical southern Michigan deer habitat, and it's great. The swamp, uh, then a row of, of uh, spruce, and then here's a row of apple trees loaded mm -hmm. with apples. And then over there is a nice dense stand of young trees under that oak. Mm -hmm. So there's a place to feed and eat. But this to me looks like a big attraction to the deer right here, the, the strip of uh, scotch pines. Sure, you know, a covered bridge, a protected travel way. They can move a long distance through this kind of habitat and be relatively undisturbed. Let's, let's go up here. We can, yeah, they like to bed down. Yeah, this tall this, grass this is grass. excellent bedding. And, Depending on which way the wind's blowing, that pine is going to give them. Okay, look at this trail here. Look at this trail here, OJ. This is, you can see where they've come from the pines, and you can see that very definitely. It's, it's come right down through here, and it leads right through here. You can, you can see in between the crab apples where the leaves are tromped down. When you stand back as you're walking, you can see this easily. Yeah, that's what you want to look for is, is the, the pattern in relation mm -hmm. to all the other things and not start concentrating on hoof prints, but, but these, these general okay. relationships, now, patterns. Now, buck rubs don't mean a heck of a lot to me because bucks are all over and they make rubs all over, but they're still fun to see. Yeah, well, you said it best a few years ago. A buck rub means a buck rubbed his antlers right. there. He ain't necessarily going to do it there again. Now, you're not going to find buck rubs on the pine trees. We didn't see any on the crab apples there, but on these little aspens is where I will look right up ahead yeah, here. There's an excellent example. And some old ones and some fresh ones we can point out too. Uh, a nice new one, probably done in August. Uh, here's one that's done fairly recently. The wood's just beginning to dry out. Mm -hmm. And then here's one, of course, that was done 
last year, maybe even the year before that. The bigger the rub, the bigger the deer generally. Well, I don't know any research to back that up. But oh, that's a, come on. Everybody knows that, Glenn. <laughs> that's a why hell opinion, and I won't argue with it. Okay, but we'll find some, some other rubs. About all of these trees have been hit. Now, some of these are old, but look at this right here. Yeah. And, and everybody say, hey, three inch tree that high, it's got to be a big sure. deer. And I'd argue this in favor of that. If a deer's going to rub that high, it had to be mm -hmm. a pretty big deer to start with. Every tree that I see in here, every little sapling, even some of the big ones like this right here, have been rubbed. And right why here. they tend to prefer these stands, I don't know. But typically, you know, this is where you look. And we looked here, here, this is what we found, we were looking for. Okay, I'd say this thick stuff right here is a big attraction for oh. the deer, this so, trail, is it because of this, this field. Sure. Let's start looking for travel lanes through here, heavily used travel lanes. But this is a little secluded spot, so this is where I say, hey, there's probably scrapes in here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tend to be more attracted to and say, this is where I'll probably hunt. So the deer can walk along here and overlook. See, the, the wind is coming up right here from the, from the lowland up the ridge here during the day. So they get a good scent of anything that's happening down there. A lot of use. Okay, right up here is a scrape. And it's in the kind of area that you know, I look for, for these kinds of scrapes. There's some vegetation overhead. It's uh, kind of secluded. And what would excite me, as you can see, this was done mm -hmm. last night. The soil's still loosely piled. Here's, you know, here's a footprint. Uh, you can see where he's had his hind feet and was pushing. Uh, you can see where he's clipped these branches off. And if I come back and check this again and find this same pattern, then you know it's a mm -hmm. scrape. You, what you might do just to, to make sure that you've got an active scrape is take a, a twig, something you don't get the scent on it, and just throw some leaves or pine needles on it like that. Mm -hmm. And boy, if that's gone in the next day or two, he's tending this scrape regularly. Mm -hmm. And so it's what I would call an active scrape. And I would want to be somewhere around here, but not right on it, mm -hmm. uh, a few yards off that way or that way. And this is probably the trail that he uses to come in here. Notice it's not heavily used. Mm -hmm. And what that suggests to me is this is one animal, probably a buck, coming in here making this scrape, tending this area, you know, early in the morning, late in the evening. Well, let's follow up here and see where he would maybe go. Now look, now here's an area where deer can go through. It's only this high and it has these prickly uh, multiflora rows, but they duck right down and go scoot right underneath there. That buck likes the thick stuff. He isn't taking the easy way through. And that's typically where you find them in very thick cover, mm -hmm. not too far from a primary scrape. And they usually get into that cover before it gets light and stay there until dark. Where, would you, where would you suppose he beds down? Right there. Right here? Mm hmm Somewhere rattling through this thicket is one of his major bedding areas. Bedding areas, scrapes, rubs, trails, tracks, droppings. They're all clues to the daily habits of white-tailed deer, and when you read the habitat, use natural camouflage for a blind and position yourself in a way that you're downwind from where you think the deer is likely to come, then you've got a good deer blind. Don't be afraid to move if conditions change, and you'll have the best chance of at least seeing deer, or maybe a buck, and that makes a day in the woods all worthwhile. <laughs> That big buck knows where he's going, but we don't. We assume he's going to continue the way he's walking. But chances are he's following a trail, a pattern that from the ground we don't see. Our cameraman and director John Ford has brought us many spectacular shots of deer over the past couple years. But Bill Martin, a Chevy dealer and hot air balloonist from Saginaw, said we ought to get a bird's eye view of the checkerboard patterns of deer habitat and watch the patterns of deer movement from the air.
from the inside. First filled with cold air, a few shots of heat from the burners sets the balloons upright where we load the baskets for takeoff. One of our pilots is Gordy Schaefer from Hubbardston, owner of the Michigan Balloon Company. His balloon is unmistakable. His balloons are busy in the summer taking charter flights mornings and evenings, but in the fall, Gordy loves to hunt deer. And before season, he takes many trips over his deer hunting territory, checking out the habitats and the deer. We're gonna float over the Maple River. You'll see two time periods here, September from our recent flight and November, which we took last year. September with foliage and November after the leaf drop. One thing you notice when you peer down through the trees is that in the heavy woods, there isn't much undergrowth. When the leaves drop, deer really can't hide well in a big woods, and aside from the acorns, there's not much for them to eat. Now, we didn't see many deer in the heavy wooded areas. Most of the time, we flushed them out of the grassy flats or brushy areas with a few trees or next to woods or fields. There they are. When spooked, they run for cover, which usually means trees, but frequently they'll be lying down in grassy areas or even fields of beans or other low crops. Here's a recently vacated deer bed quite a distance from the edge of the field. Deer like to bed out in the open, away from their runways, and this is where they bed in the summer and in the fall, but they're difficult to approach there. And when they spook, they don't necessarily follow a pattern. Now watch these deer come together and explode apart, all going different directions. They hear the burners igniting on the balloons, but they don't know where that sound is coming from. Deer runs are relatively reliable indicators of where to set a hunting blind. Look at this runway, heavily, heavily used. Most of the time, deer will walk down these trails, eventually making a rut like you see. But they also use runways as escape trails. But watch how this doe splits off the runway to get off to the side. Then she stops. She can't figure out where that balloon noise is coming from. She stops to scent the wind, cock her ears, and search with her eyes for any clue of where the intruder is. But she never looks up. And when spooked again, she'll angle back. Her ears are rotating as she runs, not sure of where the noise is coming from. She's, she'll stop to look around again. Her pattern is broken, and she isn't sure which direction to go. Remember, when she wasn't quite as confused, she used the runway, which she'll use again when she settles down. Hunters are tuned to putting stands by deer runways, but you know, deer don't always travel on the open field side. A good bet is in the corner of a woods or a field facing towards the woods. This deer is comfortable with cover around it, but watch it bolt when it crosses the clearing. It wants to get to the other side. In the cover, it stops. They almost always do. And watch this fawn bolt when it hears the balloon. I haven't said anything yet about the wind. It's blowing towards the deer because that's the way the balloons are drifting. And the deer are always running away, downwind in almost every case. Not one deer in both of our flights had crossed back and run against the wind to escape. They've all run downwind or crosswind, slightly downwind. Wind is not a big factor in determining which way a deer is going to move. They head for cover, or if they're disturbed, they change cover but they don't automatically, as many people think, head against the wind. They like edges, fence rows, scattered trees, and they stay away from open fields where there's hunting pressure or activity, or hot air balloons floating overhead. There goes one across the field out there. Why don't you feel? Oh yeah, and we out there though. Now we've spooked a buck and watched the pattern it follows. The ditch, not in one field or the other, but along the cover. You can bet there's a heavily used runway along this ditch bank. And the buck runs quite a distance before all of a sudden it makes a turn and dodges into the corn. 
And look how well the corn hides the buck. But the buck can't see through that corn either. Same situation except November. Cornfield has been cut. This agricultural event has a profound effect on deer patterns. No longer are cornfields used as cover, just as food. There are now openings that are a liability to deer. After watching deer move from a balloon, I've concluded that they move much like checkers in a checker game. Their favorite move is from corner to corner, and they avoid crossing a field in the middle. They want to get to cover where they disappear from sight. The wind picks up two hours after sunrise, and for safety's sake, we have to set the balloons down. What a way to check deer habitat, floating quietly over the treetops and fields. Back on the ground, we'll look for runs and corners linking the checkerboard fields so we can try to second guess the patterns deer follow in the fall. White-tailed deer, the number one big game animal in North America. It produces more wild meat for the table than any other species of game because it's a large animal and it's extremely plentiful. But whitetails are not easy animals to hunt. They're nervous creatures. They have highly developed senses, and they like to keep a distance between them and anything that looks, or sounds, or smells like a predator. That's why they take a few bites of food and then look around. Big bucks have a typical big buck walk. They bob their head as if it's a great pain to take a step. When he stops, you're gonna see him chew his cud. This is food he horsed down earlier and later spends hours re-chewing when he can watch for predators. The buck is the one that the hunters have traditionally been after for several reasons. First of all, bucks are generally bigger, more meat. Secondly, in the years when deer were in short supply, wildlife managers restricted deer hunting to bucks only because taking the males from the herd did not have any effect on next year's reproduction. An active buck in his prime will mate with a number of does in the fall, 10, maybe 20, or even more. That means that most of the smaller bucks simply aren't needed. The big ones take care of next year's fawn crop. Naturally, with hunters harvesting more bucks than does during a year, there are less bucks than does in the woods. But there are far more bucks and far more deer than hunters ever see. And these deer aren't usually hiding back in the boondocks either. Most of them hide right under our noses. These deer are standing because they're in the five acre range pens of the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station, a great place for us to study deer with our cameras. White tails take enormous strides when they run, often 20 feet apart. How high can they leap? Eight or nine feet with ease. In this grass, I suspect they're leaping so they can see better. Does and fawns have been seen jumping between strands of barbed wire that were a foot apart at a dead run without touching either wire. And how fast do whitetails run? Usually 20 to 25 miles an hour, but they can reach speeds up to 40 miles an hour. The size of deer is often a fooler. At a distance, they look larger than they really are. Now this one here weighs 223 pounds as he stands. Not an unusual weight for a southern Michigan buck, four and a half years old. One and a half year olds average between 120 and 150 pounds on the hoof. That yields about 30 to 35 pounds of boneless, trimmed, pure meat. This buck here is a little bony. Not the best buck to take if you're a meat hunter. Set your sights on a heavier deer, one with a little fat over the ribs. It's an old saying though that, you know, you can't eat the antlers. But antlers are still an attraction to hunters. The bigger, the better, a lot of people feel. Now this buck, for some reason, hasn't rubbed the velvet off his antlers yet. It's peeling off, but evidently, he hasn't been rubbing enough. He's also a shy buck, staying away from the rest of the herd as much as possible. Maybe the velvet is still sensitive for some reason, but this buck is a little behind in his antler development. Speaking of comparative development, in these pens at Houghton Lake are year and a half old bucks that the DNR is using to study antler development. Now, despite the fact that they eat the same food and are exactly the same age, this buck has long single spikes while his pen mate has a nice looking six point rack. There's no truth to the tale that points on a buck's antlers can be used to count its age. 
All these deer are a year and a half old. Many have four corns, little four-point racks. And one fast developer even has an eight-point rack. Now that's in his first year of antler growth. Food can influence antler size, but primarily it's genetics. The offspring of deer with big racks tend to grow big racks too. And as you might guess, big racked bucks get more respect from the rest of the deer. Watch the smaller deer scoot when this big buck moves. When he puts his headgear down and walks through a crowd, they open up a path. That's the law of the jungle with big bucks. This buck probably bumped or injured the short side of his rack some way when they were in the velvet. That's usually what causes abnormal antlers. Now, genetics is a major factor in antler size along with nutrition, but just how much a high-protein diet affects antlers in one season isn't really known. The DNR is studying that question with this group of deer right here. Antlers are the fastest growing bone in the animal world. And they are actually bones, but they're not like the bones inside an animal's body because they're solid. Antlers have no hollow center with marrow. In the wild, bucks this size and this age probably wouldn't see much breeding this year. Well, actually, now they would see it, but they wouldn't be doing it themselves. The three and four year olds have most of the action, but there's a chance that this youngster, with his highly developed rack, would do his share of breeding too. Mother Nature puts the biggest racks on the healthiest, strongest bucks. They're the ones that win the battles for the does, and their genes are passed on to future generations of deer. Next week, we're going to demonstrate specific strategies bow hunters use to locate and lure in the big bucks with scents, mock scrapes, and rattling. White-tailed deer are fascinating to study. They're the most wary of our big game animals, and this season there will be plenty taken by hunters and many more for hunters to watch during their days in the deer blinds. No animal draws more attention among sportsmen than white-tailed deer in Michigan outdoors. When you think about it, a man walking through the woods can't really spend any time at all looking for deer with any accuracy. Deer know what the woods look like as they go. That's where they live 24 hours a day. But man's eyes are actually confused by all those trees. Unless you spend a lot of time in a particular area, everything takes on a similar look. Every time you take a step, the entire woods looks different. The trees all appear to move. And if you don't want to make any noise, you have to look down at your feet. And that's time you're not looking for deer. You'll be a more successful hunter unless you're really experienced at stalking if you sit still. Let the deer do the moving. Number one rule for keeping warm and comfortable in the woods is carrying everything you need for the day with you in a day pack. Food, snacks, extra socks, clothing, rain gear, especially your heavy clothing. Now, I don't care how far you have to walk, do not wear your snowmobile suit or coveralls and sweater and scarf when you walk back to your blind. You're gonna sweat and that'll make you miserable all morning. If your boots make your feet sweat, carry them to the blind, especially if they're snowmobile-type felt-pack boots. If your head starts getting warm, take your hat off by all means, because keeping dry means keeping warm. And don't rush back to your blind. Take it easy. Make a minimum amount of noise and work up the least amount of perspiration. And ideally, you really should be in your blind on opening day a half hour before sunrise. And putting on dry clothing at your blind, even changing your socks, will make a big difference in your comfort. Now, let's talk about that blind. Ron Bacon hunted from this blind successfully every year for nine years. And as you learn about this blind, you'll see the advantages of a well-planned, well-constructed blind. If you have a blaze orange vest, you can change into a regular hat. Ron prefers this style here because it keeps the sun out of his eyes, rain out of his face, and it keeps it from running down his neck. It also allows him to hear, which sometimes tips you off when a deer is approaching from behind you. In the blind, high energy foods are the rule. They give you energy, a bit of warmth, help keep you awake. And in addition to the sandwiches and chips, take some snack foods, apples, cookies, chocolate bars, canned juices, and take plenty. Rather than eating several big meals, it's better if you nibble as the day goes on. You can stay more alert. And you never know on opening day when that deer will make its appearance. 
at 10 or 11 in the morning when hunters are going back to camp, at 1 or 2 in the afternoon when they're coming back in the woods, this activity can spook deer, and if you're alert and waiting, this might be the time you get your big buck. Now this blind is one that Ron Bacon has used year after year, made basically from pine stumps and limbs. He fills the cracks with ferns and branches each season. It's large enough so he can get up, turn around, walk back and forth, yet the only part of him that's visible from the outside is his head. Number of logs are laid parallel to the ground, used as rests for shooting, and visibility is 360 degrees every direction. What a blind. From a deer's point of view, you can see the visibility lanes. Limbs were trimmed off of trees, so Ron has a number of these lanes, some as long as 150 yards where visibility is open. No twigs are hanging to deflect shots, and believe me, this is one technique that can make a lot of difference in your success. Don't try to pick a shot through all the brambles. Wait until that buck steps into one of your visibility lanes. And like I said, Ron got nine deer from this blind in nine years. Now, under your feet, this doesn't matter if you have an elaborate blind or you're just standing by a tree for an hour or two, clear all the leaves and sticks out of the way so you're just standing and moving on the forest floor. Now, I'd bet that this November 15th, thousands of deer will be spooked by the sounds hunters make as they turn around or just move their feet one step to get in position for a shot. Leaves rustle, branches crackle underfoot, and the deer is gone. Take 30 seconds when you arrive and go ahead and make the noise, but scrape those leaves away so you can move a step or two in all directions silently. Another big consideration is the wind. If your scent is blowing to the east, don't bother looking for deer to approach that direction. But from the south, north, and west, they just might. And remember, air currents tend to move uphill in the mornings, downhill in the evenings. The deer's sense of smell is incredible. And more than anything else, that would be the factor that'll generally give you away. Now let's talk about that gun in the blind. Of course, you wanna make sure the safety is on and the muzzle is pointed in the safe direction. The nice thing about a blind like this is you can have it resting in a safe spot where you can reach for it when you need it and you won't be seen. But another nice thing, an important thing is to keep your hands warm, keep them off that cold metal. Hunting all day in a blind can get a little boring at times, especially after a bit of snacking, not seeing deer for a few hours, and when that sun comes out, well, don't be afraid to take a nap. That's one of the joys of deer hunting. Think, just think about how many deer pass in front of you while you're snoozing, though. But some hot coffee might keep you alert. Another nice thing about a blind this size is the fact you can get up, walk around, stretch. You could probably even put your right foot in, take your right foot out, uh, do the hokey pokey if you want. I suppose you can turn yourself up. I mean, that's up to you. But in a blind like this, you have plenty of room to do it. Keep in mind, that if you stay still opening day and let the deer do the moving, let other hunters move the deer, your chances are greatly improved for success. Cut some visibility lanes, build a blind large enough to move around in, take everything you need for the whole day in a day pack, don't wear your heavy clothes as you walk in, try not to touch the metal of your gun unnecessarily, keep alert, and even if you don't get a deer, you'll enjoy your opening day in the woods. There are four basic ways to hunt white-tailed deer. Hunting from a blind or a post where the hunter is hidden is the easiest and most common method. Stalking a deer once it's seen, that's the most difficult. Driving deer past hunters who are stationary is a late season technique, but the combination of methods is called still hunting, moving through the woods or a swamp slowly, stopping often and watching for deer. Bob Bolton from Midland, Michigan has taken 15 of 22 bucks this way as he did on this opening morning after a snowfall. His technique is classic still hunting. Describe to me, if you were teaching me how to still hunt like you do, how would I make my way through this stuff? Well, just basically try to pick, uh, try to pick an area that you're gonna make the least amount of noise and you don't wanna be breaking twigs or, uh, or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if there's any particular avenue you're supposed to take out there. Just get out in the thick stuff and try to move as slowly and carefully as you can. Do, do you, for example, step over things or will oh, yes. you walk around? Uh, well, if it's more than about a foot high, generally I'll walk around if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just, anything to be silent. Uh, use your ears a lot, uh, uh, use your eyes. Uh, on a morning like this morning, uh, uh, 
you couldn't hear all that good. Mm -hmm. You could hear, uh, uh, I think out of the seven deer, actually, I think I saw them all before I heard them. And I think all of them were within uh, 40 yards before I got a look at them. Why do you wear, you wear wool pants, wool shirt? Is this what you wear when you're hunting? Yes. This, this yes. is your outer clothing? Yes. Why? Uh, it's quiet. Okay, so this doesn't make noise when you rub against it. Right. Okay, underneath this you have a vest, you have a flannel shirt, you have at least two more long underwear under right. there. T-shirt, sweatshirt, insulated underwear. Uh, uh, I'm moving real slow, so I'm not going to I'm Look not going to get sweat. overheated, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, now what about your shoes? Let me see these boots here. These are still hunter's <laughs> boots. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about that. They're, uh, they're leather uh, insulated waterproof boots. Mm -hmm. uh, they're light. Uh, so they're comfortable to walk in. Okay, do you, how tight do you lace? No, you don't lace them very tight they're at not, all. They're not terribly tight, no. They're relatively new. Maybe they get broke in a little better. I'll well, let's see. The, could you lift up the sole of them here so we can see what... Okay, well, it's a good... Is this a Vibram yeah. sole? How do you carry your rifle when you're still hunting? Do you put it on a sling over your shoulder? Do you have it ready to shoot? No, I have it ready to shoot. I'll carry it like this. Uh, uh, sometimes you get into situations where you will, all of a sudden a deer will appear 20, 25 yards away from you, and it's not uncommon that you'll kind of see each other at the same time, and the deer will be looking at you about the, the same time you're looking at it, mm -hmm. and you want to be in a position to get your gun to your shoulder and shoot real quickly if you have to. Well, what's the biggest fault that hunters commit when they're still hunting? I think basically just not paying attention not uh, uh, having themselves convinced that in any given second a deer might just appear in front of them. Uh, I think they really think there is a certain psychology to it that uh, uh, you hunt better when you think you're going to see deer and you pay attention better and uh, if you're in cover like this and you're going to see them. When you pussyfoot through this thick stuff covering a hundred yards in an hour Will you often jump them up from bedding, or are they moving, or what? Occasionally you'll walk up on one, yeah, uh, and jump it up. Most of the deer you're going to see, though, will be moving, generally kind of like you are. Generally mm -hmm. they're just kind of sneaking along quietly also. So it's real important to pay very close attention, uh, listen for any little noise, any twigs to snap, uh, uh, rustling, and I'm, I'm using my ears as much as my eyes mm -hmm. every time that I stop. Okay, now if we're still hunting through here, how many steps are we going to take? Well, I think probably right here I might move around this little obstruction and get to this point. And well, I can see you're getting in the mood already. You're oh, moving. Yeah. You're moving like a snake. <laughs> okay. I would uh, then stand here for and scan the whole woods. Yes. For how long? Probably at least thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, Again, remember to look behind you, too. Mm -hmm. because, uh, they do come behind you? Oh, sure. Yeah, they can move in if many directions, depending on the wind. If you've got a good stiff wind, you're not going to have too many of them move directly behind mm -hmm. you. But, uh, uh, yeah, you can see them in any position. Now, from here, where are you going to go? You could go into the swamp. You could go along the edge. Which way do you pick? I would probably get out into it. Okay, uh, so we're going to get out into it. Which way would you try it? Let's see how quiet you can be. <laughs> This must, this is the type of thing that would drive people crazy well, to walk this slow. <laughs> you Maybe, know what, uh, what I have to do, Fred, is just get myself kind of psyched up uh, into it and have myself convinced that uh, lurking behind every tree out there is a, is a great big buck. And uh, uh, it's incredible how fast the, the time will pass. I look at my watch sometimes and uh, I think I've been doing it for a half an hour and three hours will have gone by. Do you see more deer, do you feel, than people who sit or not? I think I do, yeah, for the most part. Hmm. But it drives you buggy to sit? Uh, no, I'll sit uh, depending on conditions and depending on how, uh, how good I think a spot looks. Uh, I'll sit occasionally, but generally I'll, I'll do it in combination with still hunting. So you're 22nd deer in all these years of hunting, and you want me to help you drag it out? 
Sounds good to me. <laughs> All the way up this hill. Bob Bolton is a good example for still hunters, but safety is important when you sneak through the woods. Bob wears the minimum amount of blaze orange required in Michigan, a blaze orange hat, but in some states, a full orange vest is required. Be careful, be alert, and you might become one of those lucky hunters who puts venison in the freezer by still hunting. In using a gun, what, what am I going to have to do in buying a gun? I don't own a handgun right now. Is it a big deal? What, I go down and... and well, I don't think it's a big deal because I'm used to it. My first gun, I went through the same procedure that you'll go through now. They say that there is no gun control. Uh, in the state of Michigan, there's always been gun control as far as I know. What you do is you uh, go to your local police department and you uh, apply for a purchasing permit. And it'll take two to ten weeks, depending uh, what city or township you're in. Now that's in order to buy to purchase a handgun. A hand to purchase a handgun. Do I have to tell them exactly what handgun I'm going to no, purchase? No, you do not. All you're doing is applying for a purchasing permit, okay. which gives you the right to purchase a handgun. Now, can I only purchase one handgun on that permit? On that permit, one handgun. Yes. What, what if I wanted to buy two handguns? I go and get two permits. Two permits. Okay. Yes. One for each gun. And that takes two to ten weeks? Yeah, it's different in different townships. Some townships, uh, they have where you can only go in there uh, uh, certain hours one day a week. Uh, they don't make it easy for us. Well, how come so many people say anybody can buy a handgun? Well, I always, uh, I always uh, couldn't figure that out either because uh, you, nobody can just go out and buy a handgun. Yeah, well, you remember. Well, they have them for sale at Meyer Thrifty Acres and other places. Well, I, or I don't used to. They're for sale, but they can't sell them to you unless you have a purchasing permit. So, if I was going to buy this handgun, I go through the permit, I go buy it from you, pay you, well, and then you'd, I have you'd to. You get your purchasing permit from your local police department. Uh -huh. You come in with the purchasing permit. It has to be signed and notarized. And then there, we have a yellow form. You'll fill that out and you'll swear to all different uh, statements that you're not involved in drug, uh, no crimes, you're not a felon, so on. Now, that's a, this is a form you have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have to fill that out. Then we take one copy of your purchasing permit, give you the other two copies. You go back to the police department and you present the gun and the two copies of the purchasing permit. Then they will type out and issue you a safety card, which is really a registration card. Mm -hmm. So they know which gun I have, the serial number. That goes, gun is registered. Goes right in the computer. But, but the thing of it is, is if you were, you know, to quickly go through it, say you saw a gun, you wanted it uh, down here today, a Magnaport. I know you don't usually, you know, sell retail or whatever, but say you wanted to buy one from Larry. You have to, or you want to buy one from anybody, you have to find out which gun you want first. We're down in Mount Clemens. If you decide on a gun today, we have to go back to Lansing without the gun, get it all lined up with a permit to purchase, which takes that amount of time that Larry's was talking about, two, ten weeks, then drive all the way down to Mount Clemens, pick the gun up, fill out all the forms down here, including you've got thumbprints along the way, too. You mean so we can't and do this through the mail? No. Oh, wow. And then you've got to go right on back to, uh, since you don't live in a city, you've got to go right down to Mason, Michigan, in order to take that gun back down there and, and, and register it and have it safety inspected at that point. So you're talking about a process right now we're looking at several hundred miles minimum and uh, a month, six weeks. And how much is they going to nick me for that? What's it going to cost? Well, very few townships uh, and cities charge, but some are charging now a $2 or $5 filing fee. Uh, but after you receive, after you purchase your firearm, and okay, you have, say I, I own it, and it's, it's registered. Mine. Uh, this only entitles you to keep this firearm in your home. You can't carry it on your person. Uh, if you're going to take it to the target range or uh, for hunting, you have to have the registration card with the firearm enclosed in a case in the rear of the vehicle. The same laws pertain to as uh, in transporting a rifle for you know when you're going hunting. And yeah, except on a pistol, you have to have the shells in some other compartment of the vehicle. You have to have the shells up in the uh, glove compartment or whatever. But it's got to be locked up and inaccessible when it's in the vehicle with this permit. If you go take your 22 pistol out and decide to go rabbit hunting, you better make darn sure that shells are separated from the gun. And while you're out hunting, you should... I have to carry the permit with me? Right. And you should never, ever let even your coat, even if it's raining, flop over your handgun. 
because they're guilty of concealed, concealed weapons? weapons? Felony, five years. So if I go through all of this, I still have to get a concealed weapons permit if I want to put it under my coat? While you're hunting, to keep it out of the rain, you have to get a concealed weapons permit. Holy and that God. doesn't entitle you to carry it concealed any other time except, except while you're hunting. You can get a target one also to carry it concealed at the target. Not concealed in the car going out to the target range or out to hunt, but concealed while you're hunting. So I go through all of this and I get this gun. I can't just say, use it for personal protection. In your home, you can. In your home. Home. But yes. I can't keep it under the seat of my car. No way. No way. I can't, no way. Uh, if I'm down into the dangerous parts of uh, no Detroit way. or any city, no. I can't carry it with me. No. No, no way. Well, no. What would happen if I did? I got You'd a, be arrested. Five-year felony. Oh, no, that's a little too much to monkey with there. See, that's what I don't understand. The, the do-gooders, uh, the anti-gun people are saying, you know, they're screaming for gun control. We have gun control here in Michigan. Well, it's very stringent. You know, it must be that these easy-to-get guns, they're talking black market guns, just like they're talking well, they're heroin and, guns, and right. stolen guns. Yeah. Yeah. So handguns. I, uh, I think I am going to go handgun hunting for deer. I mean, am I taking a, a real shot in the dark, so to speak, on that? Not really, because handgun hunting is, is really growing uh, across the United States. And uh, it's... Well, it may grow, but how will I be able to do deer hunting? Well, I mean... you'd, you'd do real well with uh, some instructions and understanding the gun and uh, taking reasonable shots, you'd do real well. You're talking about me giving up a rifle Well. that I can rest on a branch and... Well, you can, you can rest that gun, too, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think once you do hunt with it and you connect with a deer, uh, I don't think you'll be using the rifle anymore. <laughs> I've learned a lot from Larry Kelly about handguns and shooting handguns, but the most important thing to remember if you want to be accurate in handgunning is to squeeze the trigger. It's basic, but the most important aspect of all shooting skills. Now watch the squeeze. Dry snapping modern handguns doesn't hurt the firing pin at all, and this really is the best way to practice, believe it or not. See me squeeze the trigger? The reason for a slow, steady squeeze is so you can hold the barrel steady. If the barrel moves just a smidgen before you fire, you miss. Now that was perfect. Now let's look through the hunting scope at this hanging metallic silhouette. My eye can't be behind the scope while the camera's looking through it, so O.J. gives me some instructions in the background. But watch, when I snap, watch the crosshairs. They stay on the target. Now that's a good squeeze, and I'd make a hit. But here's what affects accuracy, though. A loaded gun, that big 44 Magnum barks and kicks and very often causes a flinch in shooters after just a couple of shots. The kick on a short-barreled 44 is substantial, and it intimidates shooters. Now watch this shot in slow motion. Watch how high the muzzle jumps with the big bore handgun. That's what affects the slow, steady trigger squeeze more than anything. So I now have a round loaded, and watch how my finger wiggles while I'm squeezing. Watch it wiggles right there. See that? That was a flinch. I would have missed. Now, let's take a look through the scope here with the live round in the chamber. Now, I'm not at all as steady as I was when I knew the gun was empty. Again, just before I fire, I jiggle the barrel off the target. No wonder I missed. In the last second, when I was bracing myself for the recoil, I pushed the barrel down. Now, you can see in the slow motion replay that at the point the bullet was fired, I was off the target, right there, low way low. That's the effect of recoil and flinching, even if it's slight. Now look how steady I was with the dry snap. Look at that. Right on, before, after, during the squeeze, those crosshairs stayed right on the target. That's the key to accuracy. But we're only really concerned about where the barrel is pointing at the point that the bullet goes off. Got it. Oh, See that? I hit the target. Now, I, I hit because during my flinch, I pulled the barrel up. Watch. Now, here's a case where an uncontrolled flinch put the sights back on the lower outside corner just at the time the hammer fell. Right there. 
I just caught the lower corner. Squeeze the trigger. That's the key to successful handgun hunting in Michigan outdoors. 